Good evening. If you would come on in this evening, we'll try to get started up today. Again, if you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. Appreciate you being here. And come back again when you can. Silence any cell phone that you might have, if you would, so it won't be disturbed. Our opening song is number 394. If you'd like to turn to that. The 394. You have all the um, lot of lists on the back of the seat, and I'll remember these this week and keep them in mind as you offer your prayers up to the Lord. And uh, remember tomorrow, January 11th, the men fellowship at 6:30 p.m. tomorrow. Some of the ones we have to, to remind you of that's on the list that's not on this list here is. Uh, Ms. Betty Dollar, we announced this morning, Christopher Dunlap's grandmother is in the hospital being treated for an infection, septus or whatever. Also, Ms. Mary Horton is struggling with her health, and you remember her as well. And Ms. Mary Sanders is the mother of Sophia Leggett and will have surgery next week, so we need to remember her as she goes into this surgery, so uh, if you would, uh, Dale Spencer was taken to the ER this afternoon. Keep him in our prayer. We knew he had a problem. We didn't know if he made it or not, but he did. And uh, was taken. And so uh, remember Dale as well. Okay, if you bow with me with a prayer, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us the strength and all to be here today. We thank you always for the meetings on the first day of the week as you told us to observe. When we come together and sing songs and praise to your name and to hear lessons presented uh, by Gary and others, we have a very sufficient uh, group with biblical knowledge that we can truly learn from. We're thankful to have that. And very fortunate. So we thank you, Father, for your word, because the word is what keeps us on that road that we're supposed to be traveling. And there's enlightened by the light. We can walk in that light. Thank you for the, the message that's being brought to us each week. We thank you, Father, for our country again, and we pray you be with us. We need your presence now as much as we have in a long time. Help these leaders to make the right decisions that all things will work out okay. We know you're in control, Father, and we are so glad that you are. And we pray you to keep it in your mind and the providence and care that you can give to the country will be very much appreciated. So Father, Father be with us tonight as we go into our service tonight. Or it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
page zero, and we'll have our next prayer. This is my Father's
686, 686. And the song for here is lesson number 438. <clears throat> 438. Redeemed by love to proclaim him. Try again. Good evening. It's good to see everyone. Good to be together. Uh, what a great family we have. I don't, I don't know if you thank God all the time for it, but, uh, but if you're like me, I can honestly say we ought to. We ought to. It's a good group. Supportive and encouraging in so many ways. So we occasionally have little disagreements, but they don't really amount uh, to a whole lot. Acts chapter 22 is uh, one of those chapters that you would like to have thought that things would have turned out a little bit differently. Uh, in chapter 21, uh, Paul was seized. He was seized under uh, totally erroneous pretenses. Uh, some people accused him of bringing uh, a Gentile into the temple area, which, by the way, was a, was a violation. In fact, uh, we now have found, archaeologists have found uh, a part of that wall that was the dividing wall between uh, where the Jews would go in to enter the temple and where the Gentiles could be in the court of the Gentiles. That wall literally has on it that if any Gentile crosses this wall, uh, he is subject to the death penalty. But these Jews from Asia accused Paul of bringing Greeks into the temple, which he did not do. Now, he'd been with Greeks even a few days before, true enough, but he did not bring them into the temple area. An angry mob was about to, to kill Paul. I mean, that's the apparent intent that they had in mind. But the centurion there in Rome uh, intervened. And they were carrying Paul in, and of course, Paul asked for the opportunity uh, to speak. And when he finally got the opportunity to speak, it begins chapter 22. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. It starts well, doesn't it? It really does. They're listening to him. They're even quieter when they realize he's speaking in the Hebrew language. Now, as long as he says what they want to hear, they're good. 
But the second that he said something about going to the Gentiles, as soon as that comes out, they're ready to kill him again. That's it. We're not going to listen anymore. They're shutting you off. This morning, we observe very clearly that hearing is obeying. And obviously, these people are not interested in that, not at all. But the reality is that if you and I really want to hear to obey, that there's certain things that ought to be a part of our hearing. Uh, for example, we would observe that we ought to make sure that we hear discerningly. Discerningly. L listen, in 1 John chapter 4, the, uh, the Apostle John writes uh, a word of warning, as it were, because he knows what's going on. He knows there are false teachers out there. And here's his response, beginning in verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. We've got to discern you know, as well as I do, that there are many, many people right now in the world that are claiming that they are teaching what comes from the Word of God. But if you search the Bible, you know, as well as I do, that it is evident they are not following what God wanted them to do. Therefore, we must be discerning. We must listen carefully so that we can differentiate between the truth and error. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, we see that that problem was not a new one in the age of Christ, but that it goes all the way back at least to the Messianic prophet when he writes to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. How do you know when you're hearing a spokesman from God? What does he say? Does he come from the word of God? You may not realize it. We heard it, though, somewhat earlier in uh, the prayers that have been prayed here tonight. We are blessed here because when our teachers and our preachers stand up to deliver, they deliver the Word. You can search the Scripture. We will give you book, chapter, and verse. Look it up. Test it. I've begged you before. I'm going to beg you again. When you're listening to what I have to say, do not accept it initially. Check it out. Is it right? Is it not right? Our job is to hear discerningly. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, the Apostle Peter gives instruction for all teachers of the word when he says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, an oracle was, uh, was one that spoke for the God. Now, it's a little G God, but they knew what the word meant. If, if anyone is going to stand up and speak before God's people, he ought to speak for God, and we ought to be able to tell it by the words that He delivers. So we should be sure to listen discerningly, but not just discerningly. We ought to listen openly. Uh, one of the great stories in the New Testament in Paul's travels occurs in Acts chapter 17. At the beginning of the chapter, he goes to the city of Thessalonica. And when he goes to Thessalonica, there is a group that listens to him. We don't need to ignore that. But then there is another group that really is violently opposed to Paul. He ends up leaving town in a rather uh, speedy fashion, shall we say. And the next place that he goes to is Berea, another city in Macedonia. 
But the report is quite different as to what happened in Berea. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, we find Luke writing this. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Notice, receive the word with readiness of mind, an open mind. They're willing to listen. They're willing to consider. Once again, I'm going to emphasize, you start that way, you've got to examine it. You've got to test it. They did. They listened openly, and then they took it to the book and checked it out. Does it fit? Is it what God had to say? But they listened openly. The, the danger in not listening openly is that we will be prejudiced in our view, that we'll come with preconceived notions. And those preconceived notions will prevent us from hearing what we really need to hear. Look at Matthew chapter 13, beginning of verse 14. As Jesus speaks on this occasion, he says, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Why could these people not hear Jesus? They closed their eyes to the whole idea. No, it's, it's reminiscent of, uh, of the individual that, that says, I didn't see it. Well, well, of course you did. <laughs> of course you didn't. You covered up your eyes. You couldn't possibly have seen it if it was going on like that. And that's what they did. They closed their eyes to the truth. They shut their ears. That doesn't mean they didn't hear the sound. It means they didn't really hear the words to understand them. They didn't have an open heart. Prejudice against the word of God prevents one from hearing the truth. We've got to be sure that we listen openly to the truth. In Acts chapter 8, we find the story of the Ethiopian nobleman. You know, this, this story has probably been referred to uh, maybe as many as any case of conversion outside of the, the day of Pentecost in the whole book of Acts. It's a great story. Uh, Philip is urged by or told by the Spirit to run, join himself to this chariot in which this Ethiopian nobleman is riding. And in verse 30, we then find, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? Now, pause a minute. I want, I want you to just ask for a moment. How do you suppose... Most folks in 2021, the United States of America, how do you think they'd respond to that? What, do you think I'm some kind of a dummy or something? Of course I understand that. Whether they do or they don't. That's, going, that's their typical response. This man is a man in authority in a government of a nation. If anybody might have been inclined to take the... The uppity position, I guess you might say, to hold their nose up and say, don't, you know, don't, don't insult me like that. This would have been the man. But listen to the response. Verse 31, he said, how can I accept someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Here's a man with an open Mind open to the truth. He is listening openly to the Word of God. Now, what's the result of that? I think we need to examine that because it is a powerful, powerful instance. We next learn from Luke that he read from Isaiah the prophet, and we know that is Isaiah chapter 53. He's reading about the suffering servant and the question. Now, listen to this open minded fellow. He says, Basically, putting in our words, who is the prophet talking about? 
Is he talking about himself or somebody else? And then the report from Luke is quite simple, but very, very important. And beginning at the same scripture, he preached unto him Jesus. There's a message there for all of us. If you want people to listen to what you have to say, find Jesus in any passage they want to talk about. Make sure that you always find you. He's always there. Every book in the Bible is referring ultimately to Jesus. Now, some cases you've got to think about it a little while, but they do. We demonstrated that a few weeks ago in the New Testament. And we can do the same thing in the Old Testament. I just hadn't figured out how many, how many hours you all willing to sit here while I do that. You know, but it can be done. It's there. It's always there. Now watch the open-minded man. How does he respond to the preaching about Jesus? See, here is water. What's stopping me from being baptized? Now I propose to you that even today, we cannot preach Jesus without preaching baptism. All Philip preached was Jesus. And yet the eunuch arrives at this spot. What's stopping me from being baptized? Preach Jesus, preach baptism. Why? Because Jesus said that in order to be his disciple, in order to be a learner under his feet, we had to be baptized under the authority of Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Oh, Jesus also said that you've got to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. And when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and had convinced them that they had put to death the Son of God whom God raised up, and they cried out and wanted to know what we should do, what did they hear? Repent and be baptized. You can't preach Jesus without preaching baptism. And the eunuch was open to it. He wanted to know, what do I do to, and how do I get this done? Here's water. Can we do that now? There is another little sub point that ought to be seen there. He understood what baptism was all about. The baptizo, which is the word he was using, is, is the word for dip plunge or immerse. All of them mean you've got to have a pretty good bit of water. If you're talking about a grown man, there must have been much water in that place. There was much water, by the way, where John did his baptizing. And so he was baptized. How should we hear the word of God? We've got to hear discerningly. We've got to hear openly. We also must hear reverently. My sister is the keeper of the history of our family. Every now and then, she posts a picture or perhaps a, a, a letter or something like that that is from my mother and daddy or has my mother and daddy in it or my grandma and grandpa in it. And I look at those with great affection. And anything my dad wrote and by the, or any sermon that he, that he delivered, I don't have any ability to throw it away. I've got in my files over 120 scripts from television where my dad preached on television. I can't throw them away. They're useless in terms of you couldn't use it in a modern day studio. It wouldn't work. Uh, because of what they had to do back in those days. They had two giant cameras that rolled around almost on a truck you know, uh, that they used there. You couldn't do that today. They don't do it that way. Those cameras now, you know, you see them on the sideline, little bitty, little bitty cameras that you can hold. But I, I hang on to it. His tapes. I mean, I didn't have a way to listen to tapes the rest of my life, but I'm not throwing them away. To that, I hold them with a certain amount of respect. How much more so should we hold the word of God? 
How much more reverent ought we to be with words from our Father in heaven? Listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, when he said, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. When we receive the word of God, we ought to receive it with reverence. These are words from our creator. These are words from our heavenly father. They ought to be as precious to us as anything that, that you could think of. You want to listen and, and look at a remarkable tale in the Old Testament. Watch when Ezra the scribes stands up to read the word of God. What do the people do? Everybody stands up. And they don't sit down again as long as he's reading the word of God. That is reference for the word of God. And it will motivate us to do what's right, to follow his directions. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes about the Word of God in this way when he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. We'd say it a little differently. We'd say, All Scripture is, is God breathed. God breathed out. Or, if you prefer, God spoken. When we look into the words of the Bible, we are seeing the spoken word of God. How should we approach that? With reverence. With respect. Why? Because it's able to help us do everything we need to do. There's not a single good thing that you or I can do but that we cannot find the principles in this book that will guide us in the doing of it. Brethren, it's for that reason that I believe our Bible classes ought to overflow. That ought to be the one place we're all determined to be is in Bible study. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying come to Bible study and go home, forget worship. I didn't say that. But Bible study is an imperative so that we can reverently look at and listen to the Word of God. And having seen it, we need to hear believingly. Believingly. Listen, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, the writer to the Hebrew Christians in the first century is talking about them as compared to the Israelites of old. And as he does that, he writes this, For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Now, let's see if we can do a little clarification. The word gospel at its, at its root means good news. So the Israelites did hear good news. What was the good news? Go in and take the land. How'd they respond to that? They didn't believe God. God said, go take it. It's yours. They didn't believe him. No. These ten spies, over there, they, they say that that land's going to eat us up. They say that they're valiant warriors over there and they're going, that we look like nothing in their eyes. We're just grasshoppers to them. We're not going in. We don't believe you. What happened? They didn't get the good news, did they? They didn't receive it because they did not mix their hearing with belief, with faith. When you and I read the Bible, we've got to read believingly. Unlike them, we've got to recognize 
That, for example, John in 1 John says that the promise that he promised us is eternal life. Where are you going when you die? Every Christian ought to be able to answer that question. I'm going to heaven. How do you know? Because I believe God. I trust him. That's what he says in his word. I'm going. That ought to be our response. We need to give up on this thing of the past wherein somebody says, are you going to heaven? Say, well, I don't know. I hope so. Well, you hope so? Have you been doing what he said? Are you following his word? Are you believing what he says? If you are, then you ought to have confidence. And so should I. We all should have it. Because we're reading believingly. John, when he comes to the end of his book, by the way, he's got what to me is basically two great endings. Uh, the second great ending is, is, is really at the end. Uh, it's it's at, uh, in John chapter 21, and that's where he says, you know, that he supposed if we wrote down everything Jesus did and said, why, why the world wouldn't even hold the books, is what he says. That's a great ending, but I like the other ending too. John chapter 20, just one chapter earlier, verses 30 and 31 where he says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. You want to go to heaven? You got to believe Jesus is the Son of God. No wonder confession plays such a critical role in Jesus' own speaking, Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33, in Paul's writings in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. No wonder. Because that's our means of expressing, I believe it. I believe what I'm reading. I believe Jesus worked that miracle at the wedding feast in Cana. I believe that Jesus worked that miracle in raising the widow named son. I believe that Jesus worked that miracle in calling Lazarus forth after four days in the grave, from the grave. I believe all of that. I believe he was raised and that I can be too. Hear the word of God believingly and then hear it submissively. This really is the culmination of everything we've been talking about. That we've got to learn to submit to the Word of God. A, a very, very powerful set of words comes from the mouth of, of all people, Cornelius. He's not even a member of the church at that point. Instead, he's called for Peter to come, as directed, by the way, by the angel. He's called for Peter, Peter to come. Peter wants to know, basically, what am I doing here? Now, Peter's gone because that's what he was told to do. He's gone. The Spirit's made that clear. That's what he ought to do. But now, what am I doing here? He does not yet know, despite all that he'd seen. Now, listen to the response, Acts chapter 10, verse 33. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear the things commanded you by God. I know that a lot of people today want to believe and teach, and they want us to believe and teach, that God is love and He's going to love us no matter what we do. He's kind of like that old doting grandfather that just laughs and enjoys everything that that rambunctious, sometimes disobedient grandchild says and does. But Scripture does not Present that God. Oh, a loving God, no doubt about it. But a God who insists on us doing His will. That's clearly the kind of God we're dealing with. And we need to see that as we look at the Word, and we need, like Cornelius, to be listening for the, watch this, the commands of God. What does God tell us we must do? You know, the New Testament is filled with imperatives. An imperative is, is a command. It's something you've got, you must do it. Don't do it, you won't get what, whatever it is it's talking about. 
You won't receive it. So listen to Jesus. The end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Notice, do with the will of my Father. He who does it, and by the way, that word is linear. It means keeps on doing it. Does it and keeps on doing it. Isn't that what John says? We glanced at that this morning, 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. Significantly, the walk is ongoing and the cleansing is ongoing. As long as I walk in the light, the cleansing is mine or yours, whoever, the, whoever it may be. And then Jesus closes that whole sermon with a story that all the little children could tell us. In fact, most of the little children have sung a song about the wise man that built his house and the foolish man that built his house. Now, if you've sat around and watched the children sing this song, they get more excited about the foolish man because they get to talk about crash, you know, grows, the, grows his house. But the teaching of the Lord there is significant. I'm glad our children are learning it. Listen to what he has to say, beginning verse 24 of Matthew 7. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. What's the rock? Go back and reread those two verses. The rock is hearing and doing what he says. Submitting to his will. That's the rock. You build on that, your foundation is solid. Now, if, if I've ever lived any place in my entire life where folks ought to understand the importance of a good foundation, this is the place. You know, that, uh, you know, that, uh, Yazoo clay, it'll do, it will do wonders to a house, and they're not nice wonders either, are they? <laughs> it'll tear one up. Foundation, not good. You've got to have a good foundation. We understand that. Well, a good foundation is hear what God says and submit to it. Do it. But not everybody does that, so listen to the next part. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. If you hear only and don't submit, then your spiritual house will collapse. So what have we seen tonight? Well, we've seen that this morning, that hearing and obeying is important. Now tonight, we begin to understand how we've got to hear. The things that are involved, we got to hear discerningly and openly. We've got to hear reverently. We've got to hear believingly and finally submissively. I know just about maybe everybody that's here tonight. We are all acquainted with the Word of God. Does that Word speak to you and me and tell us we need to make an adjustment? Need to make a correction? It does do that sometimes, doesn't it? If it does, then now's the time. Come while we sing. Oh, do not let the word depart, and close thine eyes against the light. For sin a heart and not thy heart be saved, oh.
This is a time of envy. What these say oh, tonight? Why not tonight? Why not tonight? Why not tonight? Why not tonight? souls unite, bid live, obey, the work is done, be saved, oh, tonight, oh, why not tonight, why not tonight, why not tonight, why not tonight, Closing song will be number 587, number 587. If you're not able to attend this morning and uh, would like to partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, if you'll go to B1, uh, you will be served. We'll sing the first and last verse of 587, then we'll have our dismissal prayer. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, Precious Jesus, oh, for great to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for great to trust him more. As I prepare to close us this evening, I want to remind everybody to take your sheets. And there's a lengthy list on here of people who have requested prayers and some sick. Some of those may be having surgery. Let's keep those in our prayers this week as we continue our week. As I close us, let us go to our Father in prayer. Lord, we're grateful for this day and we're most thankful for this opportunity that we had to come together as your church this day is the church was meeting on this day throughout this state, throughout the country, and throughout this world. And we're grateful that the Word was taught this day, and that we're thankful for Gary and the message he brought us today. And we ask that you let us take that into our hearts and know that proclaiming your Word to those that we are around is very important. We ask that doors will be opened and that we can take those opportunities to teach those that are around us. We ask that you continue to be with Derek and the involvement that he's engaged with, and we ask that each one of us will look to him in ways that we can be involved. We ask that you continue to be with Logan and the efforts he's making with our youth group. We ask that you be with the parents of those youth that work with him and that they will take the opportunities to be here at each time that they have the opportunity so that our youth group can become closer and more engaged. We ask that you continue to be with the elders here as we try to 
work through our courage and our knowledge and our wisdom to lead this congregation in the truth. We ask that you continue to be with our deacons in the areas of their worship. We have many, as mentioned, that are sick, and we ask that you continue to be with those that were mentioned, Charlene Clare and the Cynthia, she tries to help take care of her with her mother being in the nursing home. We ask that you be with Dale and take him to the hospital today and that you will help those that are helping him today. We ask that you be with Joyce Robertson. Let us continue to remember Alicia's cousin, Tina and Tony, and the loss of their son, Mary Sanders, Sophia's mother, and her knee surgery. We ask that as Sophia tries to help take care of her, that you will bless them. Miss Mary Horton, her issues, we ask that you continue to be with Valerie Case and the treatment she's receiving, that they will do what they need to do to rid her body of the cancer. We ask that you be with Shannon Brown and her cousin Tammy Thompson and some other friends that she has. We ask that you continue to be with our country, Lord, in the time of transition. We ask that you be with our leaders, that they will look to you for strength. We know that it seems like our country could be in some turmoil at times from what we see. We always know that you're in control and we thank you for that and we're grateful to be a part of the body of this church that recognizes that you are in control. We ask that you be with us this week as we go into our workplace, our schools are starting back and we ask that you let us be a light unto the world that they know that we are different and would like to know that what we have they would like to have also. Give us a safe travels home, bring us back in the next point of time. We're thankful for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for our sins and the promise of heaven. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.